we warmly welcome you to this week's weekend meeting. Our Bible discourse today is entitled, Slave for the Master of the Harvest. But first, let's join our voices in... When you think of these expressions, uh, slave for the master of the harvest, if you're not a Bible student, that might actually sound like a triple negative. Slave, master, harvest. Sounds like a lot of work. But what's going to be interesting about our discussion today is we're going to find that all three of those expressions, every, every single one of those, is something that is not negative at all, but quite positive, and we'll find out why. So when we think of any decisions that we make, we want to make sure that we factor in all the things that will help us make a good decision. And since this is one of the most important decisions that we'll ever make, let's make sure we're paying close attention. First of all, where did the uh, this expression slave come from? Well, it was actually Jesus Christ himself. In Matthew chapter 6, in his Sermon on the Mount, notice in verse 24, he said, speaking to his disciples, uh, no one can slave for two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick to the one and despise the other. You cannot slave for God and for riches. So he's making it very clear that the term slavery is not a negative thing. Um, here in the United States, uh, as is true with most of the world, uh, slavery evokes a mental thought process that is very sad. We think of heartache, we think of torture, we think of people being ripped away from their home countries. We think of uh, abuse. And then when the word master comes, well, most of that abuse came at the hands of the master. But not so in this particular instance. Uh, now, one thing that's interesting is that when slaves were purchased in ancient times, it was probably with something of great value like gold. So a purchase price of gold would be common. But what would be the purchase price of these slaves? Well, because the Apostle Paul used the expression in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. Well, the price is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So that shows us the value of the slaves. And so we want to make sure that we understand that this slavery is going to be something we could welcome. Because it's interesting that once we benefit by that purchase price of the shed blood of Jesus, then what happens is we are emancipated from the slavery of sin and death that we were all born into. So it's a, it's a really a fascinating concept. And it's interesting, that this isn't new, because back in the nation of Israel, if you'd like to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 15, we'll find that there was a provision for Hebrew slaves. After seven years, they were given their freedom. But in Deuteronomy 15 and verse 16, notice what it says. But if he, that's the slave, says to you, I will not go out from your company because he loves you and your household since he's been happy while with you. We're immediately uh, understanding the sense that instead of a slave-master relationship of abuse and torture and all that sadness, just the opposite. We see a camaraderie. He said, I will not do this. I will not believe because I love you and your household. I'm happy with you. And so that's the mental connotation that we want to think in terms of here. And Jesus set the pattern for us in that regard because he, he made it very clear during his ministry how much he enjoyed serving his master and his father, Jehovah. Now, all of us, everybody on earth, basically has two choices. They're going to serve one of two masters. The one master will be Jehovah God, and the other master is Satan the devil. And you cannot serve both. And so now that we've determined what slavery involves and, and what, it, what it really means to be part of this group, let's go to this factor number two that would help us in our decision-making process, and that is, who is the master and what is he like? And we get a real nice indication of that when we turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. So let's open our Bibles there to Matthew chapter 9. And we know that Jesus was the perfect reflection 
of his father. And so when we see how Jesus reacted in given situations, we, we know how Jehovah, the master, would react. So in this particular instance, in Matthew chapter 9, let's start with verse 35. And Jesus set out on a tour of all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and curing every sort of disease and every sort of infirmity. Now, friends, key in on verse 36. On seeing the crowds, he felt pity for them because they were skinned and thrown about like sheep without a shepherd. And see, that's when he said to the disciples in verse 37, Yes, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Now, the first part of this really shows us how the master feels because Jesus reflected the feelings of his father. And as he looked at these people, he felt pity for them. He saw that they were skinned and thrown about. He saw that they were uncared for. He saw that they weren't being taken care of because they really didn't have a shepherd. But now, don't you find it fascinating that even though he knew work would be involved, because any farmer knows that there's all sorts of work on that farm as you're, as you're working throughout the year. But he said, yes, it's great. There is a tremendous amount of work. But in verse 38, he said, therefore, beg the master of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So what does that indicate? Well, what kind of a relationship would a slave have to the master if he can just go to the master and say, master, we need more help? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Again, what kind of slave that's being abused, or when we think of the slavery in the past, what kind of slave would have gone to his master and said, hey, it's kind of tough out here in the field. We need help. Uh, could you give us more help? That would be unheard of. And so here we see that beautiful relationship, and that's exactly what we want to remember. Now, not only did Jesus say to his disciples, there's work to do, but our father, the master, is going to help us, so therefore ask for help. Let's just go to the next chapter, chapter 10. And notice there in verse 1, so he summoned the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits in order to expel these and to cure every sort of disease and every sort of infirmity. So he now gave to his men the authority to do many of the things that he was doing. And as you read this 10th chapter, it's a beautiful example of how he did not allow them to be unprepared for the work that they were going to do. Quite, quite the contrary. He gave all sorts of very specific instructions. Uh, and, but notice in verse 7, this is really the key. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. So the focus of that ministry was the kingdom. And then he also gives the Simpsons some excellent advice. He says, don't acquire gold and silver or copper for your money belts or a food pouch for the trip or two garments or sandals or staff for the worker deserves his food. And then he reminds them, when you go into a village, be very specific. Look for certain ones because what was the goal? The goal was to bring in new disciples. So he says, search out who in it is deserving and stay there until you leave. In other words, stay there until you've made a disciple. And then he refers there in verse 12, when you enter the house, greet the household. If the house is deserving, let the peace you wish it come upon it. But if it is not deserving, let the peace from you return upon you. So how encouraging was that? Jesus was helping us to appreciate and helping those men that he was training to appreciate that even if it wasn't always successful, that was okay because the success was the fact that they were doing the work. And so there was an excellent uh, encouraging words here from Jesus in that regard. Because they were fully aware of the fact that many of those Jews that they were talking to were tough. They were hard-headed. They had their preconceived ideas. But he said, those aren't the ones that we're after. We're after the ones that have a, a heart that's open, a mind that's open, and that we can talk to. Now, what would the result be as, a res as, as they were doing this work? Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, and we'll see. 
Luke chapter 10, and let's go to verse 17. Because he had sent the 70 out, he'd given very specific instructions. Then the 10, re the, the ten returned, saying, I can't believe how difficult this was. It was so hot and miserable. Oh, no, that's not what he said at all. But they weren't complaining. They weren't, they weren't finding it difficult. Notice, let's key on the word. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are made subject to us by the use of your name. And then can you imagine the joy that that brought to Jesus, who had sent them out? Because in verse 18, at that he, Jesus, said to them, I see Satan already fallen like lightning from heaven. And yes, he had given them a lot of authority, but notice in verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice because the spirits are made subject to you, but rejoice because your names have been written in the heavens. And so what a beautiful expression we find here. We find that this is a, this is a time of great joy. What the disciples were doing, what Jesus had taught them to do in this harvest work was truly bringing them great joy. Now, how successful was it? Well, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And notice in verse 41. Acts, oops, I'm in Luke, sorry. Acts, chapter 2. And verse 41. And it says, so those who gladly accepted his word were baptized. And on that day, about 3,000 people were added. Can you imagine 3,000? Go down just a few verses later. Praising God and finding favor with all of the people. At the same time, Jehovah continued to add to them daily those being saved. Now, what does that tell us? Remember what Jesus had asked his disciples, those slaves, to do? Remember he said, beg the master of the harvest to send more workers? What was the master doing? What was the master Jehovah doing? He was listening to their prayers, and he was continuing to add to them daily those that were being saved. What did that result in? Well, just turn over two chapters in Acts to chapter 4. And here in Acts... Chapter 4 and verse 4, however, many of those who had listened to the speech believed, and the number of men became about 5,000 disciples. So think about this, 5,000 individuals now, this had grown to in that kind of capacity. So what we, we find that from even after Jesus was dead now, and because all this took place from Pentecost forward, saying the devil was noticing. He was seeing this tremendously grand increase. But Jesus knew that this, this great harvest campaign was going to be so successful that it would not go unnoticed, and nor would it be something that would not be uh, directed by Satan as far as something that he was going to do. And so Jesus prepared his disciples for that as well. How do we know that? Well, that, go, that takes us to point number three about the harvest work itself the significance of the harvest work, and what it really involves. So let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Let's go back to Matthew. And then this is a very powerful illustration. Jesus is here explaining exactly what's going to take place at the climax or the time of the end. So starting with Matthew 13 and verse 24. Jesus had, had been giving a series of illustrations all relating to the kingdom message. And so in this particular illustration, it says he presented another illustration to them saying, the kingdom of the heavens may be likened to a man who sowed fine seed in his field. While men were sleeping, his enemy came and oversowed weeds in among the wheat and left. When the stalk sprouted 
and produced fruit, then the weeds also appeared. So the slaves of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow fine seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy, a man did this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go out and collect them? He said, no, for fear that while collecting the weeds, you uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the harvest season, I will tell the reapers, first, collect the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them up. Then gather the wheat into the storehouse. Now he proceeded in that on this particular occasion to use several other illustrations, but what's fascinating is that when the men that he had been talking to, uh, when they all got together afterwards and went into the house in verse 35, notice what the question was that was really on their mind. His disciples it said that after dismissing the crowds, he went into the house, into that house, and the disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the illustration of the weeds in the field. They were fascinated by that, that illustration. So there's nothing left of the imagination here. Nothing at all. In response, Jesus said to them, The sower of this fine seed is the Son of Man. That would be him. The field is the world. As for the fine seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, but the weeds are the sons of the wicked one. So the sons of the kingdom are, are those disciples that were um, that Jesus was making, and then at Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit, now they were part of this group that was going to be this wheat class, this group of individuals that were going to be going to heaven with him. But notice verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is a conclusion of a system of things and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are collected and burned with fire, so it will be when in the conclusion of the system of things. The son of man will send his angels and they will collect out from his kingdom all things that are causing stumbling and people who practice lawlessness. And then notice in verse 43, he said, at that time, the righteous ones will shine as brightly as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let the one who has ears listen. So what was fascinating about this entire discussion is Jesus was making it very clear that Satan the devil was going to seize an opportunity. And the timeline was when he gave his illustration here at the very beginning. Notice he says, when the disciples were sleeping, or in this particular case, uh, when the apostles died, that meant the restraint was now gone. It was, it, was, it was out of the picture. And that gave Satan the devil the opportunity to allow the seed that he had sown, these individuals that were hypocritical, religious, uh, what appeared to be religiously disposed people that were fake. They weren't real Christians. And what were they doing? They were intermixing and they and for hundreds and hundreds of years for centuries it wasn't very evident where the true christians really were were they there well sure they were but what happened jesus makes it very clear that during the conclusion of the system of things and the conclusion of the system of things of course uh, when, once jesus became king in 1914 this this timeline open now we realize the, the 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 very significant time of harvest that he was referring to and so we had a beautiful illustration in our um, christian life and ministry meeting back in february of 2018 and it showed him sowing the seed satan coming along over sowing it with the, the what would probably be in literal terms that bearded darnell which looked very similar to wheat but what happened Jesus said, no, no, leave everything until the end of the, uh, the harvest period. And, and during that time, the angels will come and they will separate exactly who my wheat are and they will gather them in the store, storehouse. So in 1919, all those faithful ones that had died over the years that were part of that faithful anointed group, 
they would go to heaven and now they were with Jesus. They were in the storehouse. They were safe. But was the work done? Well, no. Even though they would be shining as illuminators in the world, even though this anointed class, the, the ones that were, this, the, these anointed ones that were still on the earth realized that there was far more work to do because notice what Jesus had said in John chapter 10 and verse 16. Because as far as the harvest was concerned, there was a lot more work to do. And notice who it involves. John chapter 10, verse 16. He says, and I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. Those too I must bring in. And they will listen to my voice and they will become one flock, one shepherd. And so in the 1930s, it became evident that this, this group, this other sheep that he referred to here, or in the Revelation account, this great crowd which no man could number. In fact, let's just uh, note that as well. Revelation chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10. After describing the 144,000, which was a very finite or a very specific number, notice in verse 9 he said, After this... I saw and look a great crowd, which no man was able to number, out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands. And so we have this beautiful description of a work that was going to be done, and that these anointed brothers, these anointed brothers of Christ, would uh, understand the significance of, of finding these individuals. And today, that's what we're invited to share in. We're, we're invited to be slaves for the master of the final harvest. This tremendous work that's taking place. And, and you know, it's interesting because in John chapter 4, Jesus uses a beautiful illustration. It's uh, John chapter 4 and verse 35. Let's just turn there. John four thirty-five. Uh, and it compares what we might conclude as opposed to what Jesus might conclude. He said to his disciples on that occasion, do you not say there are yet four months before the harvest comes? So when Jesus spoke those words, it was probably between November and December, and the wheat would have been only a few inches high and been totally green. Look, he said, I say to you, lift up your eyes and view the fields that they are white for harvesting. Already the reaper is receiving wages. Well, clearly he wasn't talking about a literal harvest because the wheat, that was going to be four months later before the wheat was, was ready to harvest. And yet notice he said, already the reaper is receiving wages and gathering fruit for everlasting life. So clearly Jesus had in mind something else. Well, uh, it's interesting in our, in our study Bible, one of the side notes uh, in our reference Bible says this. It says he may have been referring to uh, a crowd of Samaritans that were approaching with their white robes on. Or it says we, he may, may have been a figure of speech indicating that they were ready to accept the message. Whatever was the case, Jesus recognized that there were many people that were ready to listen. And so again, even though Jesus might, Jesus' disciples might have been thinking, Lord, these people are rocks. They don't listen to anything. Uh, the vast majority are, no, no, Jesus said, listen, the fields are white for the harvesting. Well, let's fast forward to where we find ourselves today. What are we seeing today in our ministry? Well, if we continue to work hard in our ministry, if we're slaves of this final harvest, we're finding that as we work, as we're diligent in our, in our preaching work and promoting the kingdom interest in, in a way that's, that's appealing, that people even now will continue to respond. Even though we're living at one of the most difficult times of all human history, when people, uh, it, it's very anxious. To, during this pandemic, to see the way people have responded down here in New York City, to see the violence that's spiked, to see the, the, the election and all the heartache that comes with that, to see the anxiety that this seems to be everywhere, will, will people respond? Absolutely. 
hasn't been exciting to see the last service year, uh, around 800 people a day are responding to the kingdom message. So what does that tell us? Friends, it tells us that being involved in this harvest work is one of the greatest blessings that we could ever find ourselves involved with. Prior to the pandemic, uh, some of the new forms of witnessing, special, special metropolitan witnessing, harbor witnessing, prison witnessing, uh, some of the different features. During the pandemic, many of you have had to do something that uh, maybe you weren't ever comfortable with before. Um, letter writing or telephone witnessing. But what is the result of that? As you listen to friends have these beautiful experiences, you realize, oh my goodness, uh, the, the goal that we have as Jehovah's people, as being slaves for our master, is paying off. It's truly of great benefit. So, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, just have plenty to do in the work of the Lord. So, the last point that we want to make here, the last factor we want to think in terms of factor number four, is what it will mean for us personally if we do what we've been asked to do. What an honor. What an honor and privilege it is to share in this great harvest work today because we're doing so under the direction of the master of the harvest, Jehovah God himself. And the blessings and joys that um, we receive are innumerable. There is, there is no greater privilege than watching someone, watching a Bible student that we're teaching, respond first in little ways and then in greater ways. And then pretty soon they start saying, we, instead of you all. And it's just a beautiful thing to watch, to watch them learning the truth. And when you think of the great crowd that have the prospect, as the Revelation account tells us, of coming out of the great tribulation into the new world, and to know that we were part of that process taking place, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Knowing that we will see ourselves return to the days of our young manhood, knowing that we'll greet back, bring back when the resurrection begins, all of our loved ones that we've lost. And during the last few months, uh, Many of us have gone to more funerals than we've gone to in years because of this, this pandemic. And so the blessings are many. And so, friends, after considering these four facts, after determining in our minds, who is, what, what, is it, what does it mean to be a slave? Who is the master? What does this uh, harvest work really entail? And what are the blessings that are associated with it? Maybe it'll make it easier for us to make our decision. Now, for the vast majority that are listening today, you've already made your decision. You know exactly what it is that you want to do. You, you, you're already masters. You're, rather, you're already slaves of the master. We say to you, stay the course. For others that are perhaps studying the Bible, or maybe you've just been hanging around, you come to the meetings, but you haven't made that decision yet to dedicate your life to serve Jehovah, maybe... Some of the points in these in, in, that we've covered today will help you to make that decision to join us and to be slaves. And third, for those of you that might have once made the right decision, but for some reason you got sidetracked, you, you, you got uh, uh, distracted by Satan's world, please return and help us. But let's all join in unison as we happily and with great joy make the decision all as one, and that decision is very simple, slave for the master of the harvest.